All right, what's up, what's up? Welcome into the Orange Zone podcast. I'm Tommy Sladek. We have Ashley Winskowski. We have Samantha Cross and Rachel Culver's on vacation. So we have our news operations manager and the brains and the architect, uh, one of them behind this set. That's Brian and Ellie on the producer, Mike. Welcome in. On today's episode, we are getting into the weeds with Syracuse football spring practice. We had some big updates on player personnel and some no names. Ashley will be getting into that. We also have Syracuse lacrosse, just two games left for these teams as they're both trying to hunt and make the postseason. The women, it's looking good. The men have a little bit of work to do, and we'll get into that. And then, yeah. Judah Mintz, is he staying? Is he going? We'll talk about some updates on the transfer portal and a guy that we know for sure that's coming in, and Eddie Lampkin. So first off, it's a beautiful day in, Sy- in Sy- Syracuse in central New York, and I needed this so badly. I really did. It's like hot out. It's like, <laughs> this is this is going to sound like me complaining, but it was, almost, it was almost like jarring for a second when you, I'm like, I'm sweating. Like, I, I cannot believe how hot it is all of a sudden, but I totally agree. Really nothing to complain about here. It's an amazing feeling to just, it's not even so much the heat. I think it's the sun in general. I think mm. the sun, I'm like, my, my spirit is uplifted. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, my spirit is no longer broken. It will all be okay kind of thing, you yeah, know? Well, spring kind of doesn't exist in Syracuse. It goes oh, from like 30 no. degrees to 70. So. We've exactly. talked about this a ton. It, it, is, a, it is a three season place totally. it just it just is totally yeah with hot, with peaks and valleys all over the place because it feels like just last week that we have some footage from su football spring practice and there's <laughs> snow in the background and then ashley's there this morning and everyone's in t-shirts Could or like a, a quarter zip how was could you feel because um, i'm sure some of the players especially the transfers right <laughs> that come in <laughs> yeah, the yeah. second semester because yeah. right. if you're here in syracuse in the fall you're like okay you're seeing it at totally. its best but if you are starting off your your, your journey in central new york in in january oh it's a wake-up call oh boy like what did king joseph think coming here in january? i don't know especially everybody from georgia i know there's some guys like mm-hmm. the strength coaches from miami like that has to be crazy but no today was the Good first vibes. day yeah today was the first day they kept it outside at least that we've seen um maybe they did that on saturday as well but they kept the whole practice outside and yeah good vibes sun's out it feels like we actually might be playing some football soon not too soon but here we soon go enough. yeah spring game it's indoors but hey we know we're going to be dry when we're at that one so uh give me the scoop because we did did have some big news this morning. Yes. Um, by the way, it was so refreshing to hear injury updates coming out of the mouth of a head coach, Brandon Brown. Real Ooh. life, actual detail. I mean, he's getting into it. And I'm like, is this real? Like, we're we're not here now. We. That's all I'll say. No more hours. That feels good. Anyways, it's refreshing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, yes, he said Aronde Gadsden was kind of on the sidelines today, not really participating. Um, Coach Fran said that he really wanted to keep him blocking this spring mostly. We did see him catching some passes in the first few practices, but he wanted to keep him blocking just because of that foot injury that he's still recovering recovering from. Um, very serious. That you know, some guys don't even make it back from that surgery. Mm-hmm. So, uh, long timeline of recovery, and he just recently had the surgery to get the screw out of his foot. Um, so he is out for the rest of the spring. He's not going to play in the spring game, but I, I don't think that's really news. I think that is a bit anticipated, um, with, in terms of what we knew his recovery timeline was. Um, and then he said he'll be ramping it up for in the summer. And then, um, the Georgia transfer wide receiver, Jackson Meeks, who we got a chance to speak to the other day. Um, he also had a lingering foot injury um coach brown describes it as like a little stress fracture in his foot hairline he said so he got surgery for that this week and he anticipates him to ramp up in the summer as well and it's interesting watching those guys in practice right because it feels like they were going full tilt leading up to that so it just kind of shows you the there's some intricacies when it comes to recovering some of these and and aronde's was the list frank am i saying that right i think so probably is like a french pronunciation but i don't know and he's one of those guys where (laughs) yes i list off wrong country (laughs) Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just leaving. No, that felt good. It, it's, it's needed. I knew you were looking at my hair. I'm sorry. I just had to fix one thing. Okay. I'm ready to go. All right. Good. I'm a true good, friend. Good vibes. Yeah, you, you are. are a good friend. No, that's that's loyal. Yeah, absolutely. I will let you guys know if I saw something. I know. No, Thank you would. Your hair is sticking straight up like alfalfa. Yeah. alfalfa. I'd let you know. Alfalfa. <laughs> <laughs> I let you know. You're alfalfa. Fix it. <laughs> Little rascals, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Rondé. Rondé, yeah. He's one of those guys where there was so much excitement leading into this past season because I think we all looked at it and said, this is someone that could really be a high draft pick in the NFL. He has it all. He has all the makings of a pro 
receiver, tight end, whatever you want to call him, uh, receiver skills for sure right now. And we see him for a half in the Colgate game to start the season. It's a blowout, so he's sitting most of the second half. Western Michigan, I believe it was the first or second drive. Yeah. There was the tiniest taste of a Rondé Gadsden in that full form. And so to know that we're hopefully going to see that guy back this this fall, it's exciting. Yeah, and that's what Coach Fran said with both him and Meeks. Like, just take care of it now. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no reason to run these guys into the ground in April. And that's what he said about Meeks, too, is, like, it was bothering him still. He could tell, and he was trying to say, like, he could play through it. There's no reason to play through it in April. Same with Aronde. Just, like, get that full recovery. Be 100% in August and September. Well, because, honestly, to your point, I remember last year – what did we find that out at Purdue that he was out for the rest of the season? It was like the just most chaotic. just it was just, it was very chaotic, but also like just such a gut wrenching feeling like it really was one of the, the worst, lowest points of the entire year. Because as you said, it's like he was one of the people who was giving the program such juice and such excitement. So to know that all of a sudden the rest of the year you'd be without him, of course, it's followed by several other injuries after that but that felt like the beginning of a little bit of a downward spiral like I really felt like the year would have been at least at least a little bit different if he was there and and there the whole time so I'm, I'm extremely excited to see him back especially now that so many other things have changed too I completely agree because that's the power of a number one receiver mm -hmm. right and he was it for Garrett Schrader and after that we really didn't see someone step up and fill that void consistently right it was got Yamari Hatcher for a game Dan Valori for a game right. I think he's one of those dudes that just brings consistency and if you're Kyle McCord or any type of quarterback you look at him and it's it's a feeling of safety right you feel yeah. comfortable knowing that if you go his way he's going to do some miraculous things to get that ball but there's also a bunch of other dogs on this roster now and not and not to mention Hatcher Valori some of these dudes coming back but Meeks Zed Haynes, shout out North Penn High School. Uh, it's a it's a wide receiver core that's been really impressive so far. Yeah, and I don't. We've talked about this before, but I don't think that had to go into McCord's decision, right? That he felt confident and comfortable coming here with you know some some options to catch his passes. I don't think he would have came here aside from all of his you know knowing Fran Brown and all that if he didn't feel good about the receiving core. Big time. But and, it's exactly yeah, exactly like from what you two both say. To me, the difference here this year is also it's that versatility. I think that feeling and that sense of safety and security comes from the fact that there are multiple options. The depth. When it yes, like when it was when it was Gadsden and Schrader, it felt like when Gadsden was out, all of a sudden Schrader lost the peanut butter to his jelly. Yeah. And what what are you gonna do? Just eat a jelly sandwich? <laughs> no. I don't know why I'm in a weird mood today. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I really feel like there's just, I feel like this year's more of a checks mix. I feel like there's more options to choose from. And that is to me what gives me that feeling of security is knowing that there are gonna be several different options and several different looks. Um, so that that to me from an offensive standpoint is the thing that I'm most excited to see is what kind of creativity and what kinds of players they're going to be utilizing. I agree. And I also, um, Fran said this morning, like I asked like what has surprised you now that we're getting towards next week's the last week of spring practice, spring game next Saturday. And he said um, the run game, which I know Syracuse fans are sick of the run game because of last year and all that. But, you know, he was like, we really do. If I want to be able to, if we have to run the ball, I'll get run the ball a hundred times and have them not be able to stop us. So I just thought that was interesting that he pointed that out with LeQuinn. Obviously, we know is kind of geared up for another monster year and, uh, you know, the pieces behind him. That's it, very yeah. interesting. I love that he said the run game. That actually made me just feel really excited. Right. Well, all the attention has been on McCord. And right. The, right. And we're going to have a passing game now. But, you know, run game, we could still use a run game. Still got to run the ball. And here's a few Fran Brown quotes that we thought would be most interesting to you. Take a listen. Coach, we saw Jackson makes it on the board on his foot today. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize this situation? Yeah. Oh, you got to go get some. We had like a little hairline fracture. And, uh, He'll be out four weeks, so uh, he was he kept trying to practice. No, I'm good, coach. I'm good. I say let's get an MRI, check it out. He found something in it. It's been happening. Last year he was playing on, and we kept giving him treatment. And I was at uh, the other spot, so he got treatment for a whole year. So he's had a, a break in his foot for a while and played on it. So sent him to go. Uh, he'll go get surgery today on it, just so that way he can be ready for summer workout. So decided let's get it done now. He wanted to finish spring. Now nah, we're not finishing spring. Go get it done now. So then you back for summer workouts. So we keep working on that mental and physical toughness. We saw Rondé Gadsden off to the side as well. Is that just kind of veteran maintenance as he comes back from his injury? No, not veteran maintenance at all. Remember, he had this, uh, got the surgery last year and he had the screw in it. So my goal was for him to just block the first four practices and work on his block and him being able to do it. And then I sent him out last week 
to uh, go get go get the screw taken out so he could be ready for summer workouts. I'm really not worried about, you know, we want to be ready when the time comes. And, uh, you know, I think he's a really good football player. So we need to triple team him at practice. So why not have him ready? If I wait till after spring ball, then that puts us back more. And then now we're in the summer and he's not able to work out at the max, his max capacity. And then I wouldn't be helping him work on his mental and physical toughness also, because there's some things he needs to build up mentally, you know, to be right. And if he come, becomes a better blocker, um, you know, he'll, be, he'll have a good future in life just if we can teach him to block better. So I figured let's get this done now for this kid because, uh, you know, he's one of the better football players on our team. I think one of the better football players throughout college football. So I want to take care of him and do what's right for him and not just for us. That was your new head coach, Fran Brown. And you also spoke with Nick Williams, who we were really excited to speak with. New DN's coach comes over from working with Coach Prime at Colorado. What's Nick's deal? First of all, the story about how Nick Williams met Fran Brown is so interesting. As I feel like Tell every it. Fran Brown, how he met everyone is so <laughs> interesting. Like he just collects people from across the country. But uh, he he told it a little bit how he met Fran Brown getting off a train. He was getting on. Fran was getting off. Ran into him. Fran was all in Georgia gear at the time, two years ago. And they just started talking. And they talked for about 40 minutes, an hour. And uh, Nick Williams said he left that conversation. And he said, I want to work for Fran one day. I know he's going to be a head coach one day by his mentality. I want to work for that man one day. Literally, in his own words, manifested it. And uh, then it all worked out. Fran gave him, a, gave him a call. And, of course, he knew Elijah Robinson uh, from Texas A&M as well. He spent some time there. So it all fell into place. And, yeah, he said he's really thrilled to be here. He loves Syracuse. He, he loves how it's going so far. And he, he has some weapons this year, King yeah, Joseph. He does. But, you know, even more than the freshman. Big time. And here's some sound from Nick Williams. Coach Fran makes us work out three times a week, which I love. So I'm in the weight room. And. I kind of keep that energy going. The kids like high motor, high energy guys. You know, how am I asking my guys to run to the ball and I'm not running to the ball? That just doesn't make sense to me. Coach, so. we've heard it mentioned a few times this spring that you guys, the coaching staff, are doing the workouts like you mentioned. What does that look like? You said three times a week. You guys in there before the guys, with the guys. Oh, we're up early. Oh, early in the morning now, like 5.30. Um, no, early. Some guys work out at lunch. Some guys work out in the afternoon, but I'm more of an early morning guy. I need to get in and get going. But this is my first place where coach, uh, a head coach has made it mandatory, and I love it. You know, my wife loves it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and how about the coaches staying in shape? Love that. Yeah, yeah, the coaches, uh, according to uh, Coach Williams, are working out three times a week, mandated by Fran Brown. He said some Love of them that, get in there. <laughs> Wait, so why, why is it mandated for the coaches? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? Just because, like, and that's what Williams was saying, if I'm asking you to run around all day and run to the ball and, you know, be in shape, why don't the coaches in shape? Hmm. If the coaches are walking around with an unhealthy lifestyle and, like, out of shape, like, that's what example are you setting? Which I think is cool. That's how Fran's trying to do everything, by example. But, yeah, he said they're working out three times a week. Sometimes get in there. He said he gets in there at 5.30 a.m. Some coaches do it at lunch. Some coaches, whatever. I love that. I yeah. can't even state how much I love that. I need to know more about it. Like, how who tracks it? Did the strength coaches make, like, routines for them? Like, little programs? I need to know more. But, yeah. And there's a not noticeable increase in activity with the coaches during practice as well right like i would love to see what their step count is yeah. fran brown is probably burning 2000 calories of practice oh, yeah. and he's always in shorts because he's always on the move he's running those guys are moving and you can feel that that if it does feel like they want to match that energy and to get the players to to reach that height that they want they're like i guess i'll set the example as well i think it's neat i love it I ride with it, and as a player, I think that's pretty cool, too. I love it. I think if you have the players running everywhere, like he said. I pulled up this morning. I pulled up at, like, 8, 10, like, five minutes before. I see them running from into Ensley. Like, they were running. They start across. What is that other building called? Um, Where they have those point, meetings well, and the press conference. Lally like, the Lally Athletic Center. Complex. Yeah, if you know. So, and they're, like, sprinting into yeah. Ensley. And I was like, oh, my God, good morning. Wait, at this point, by next week, they're going to have the journalists <laughs> doing sprints. <laughs> Literally, we could have a media cup. <laughs> I'm still down for that. I still want there to be a, a media pro day. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. me too. We have Sam to do it in our suits. <laughs> Sam would smoke them. Smoke the cop. We'd yeah. see, we'll see about it. Yeah. Just join the punning crew. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lally, John Lally and Zaire Franklin will be kind of celebrity coaches for the spring game, which is, I think, a cool twist. I think there's a lot of people excited to see what that spring game is going to look like. It's at the Dome, night of April 20th. 
2 p.m. that day, Paul Gates' re jersey retirement will be happening with SU Men's Lacrosse in their regular season finale. But spring game will be cool. Um, I want to bring in Brian and Ellie, who's on the producer mic. Brian works. He so again, Brian was is the the brainchild of helping create this space, and he's a, a huge help, and he's one of the only reasons that we're able to really do this. But Brian, you also work at the Dome, and you do some replay, and you have a very important role. And fans, I think, appreciate you, man. So thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, so I work with the Dome TV crew, as we're called, and we're not doing the outside broadcast like ESPN or ACC Network. We're literally the broadcast group for the video boards. So I've done a lot of roles, handheld camera, technical director like I'm doing for your show right now, and also replay uh, booth stuff for them as well. How do you guys get the replay done so quickly? Because it is, it is <laughs> lightning quick. Yeah, and is crazy. that practice? What's the key to that? The key to it is this really expensive machine called the EVS, which is just a really, <laughs> think about it like a very like responsive DVR with four to six or eight channels of it. And that's how it's done in all major broadcasts and stuff like that. I was actually there the day it was delivered when they got the new gear and um, Jackie Antonu, who runs our program, said, can you grab that box? We got to bring it up to the room. And I was carrying it, uh, walking under the stadium control and onto the elevator. And she said, don't drop that. That's the EVS. It costs about $250,000. Oh it was, like, it was literally like kidding? carrying a house in a box. Oh I my was like God. kind of terrifying. I, I would have like <laughs> gone out. I would have created myself into like a Michelin man, like in bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. I yeah. first of all would have dropped it. Yeah. I would yeah. I would have dropped it too. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Most likely <laughs> drop it. But it's a wow. great system. It's really fast and, and very cool to use actually it's kind of fun yeah well from the, from the fan perspective i think it's so cool how quickly the replay happens and it helps you guys when there's a big player who who, who like who did the ball go off of out of bounds it's like you guys work quick and it's pretty awesome i mean they have they have three angles ready in like less yeah. than 30 seconds it's it really is like amazing how they're all like pieced together so fast but i feel like from brian your standpoint and what you do i feel like that's so important because i love hearing the crowd reaction like i want to hear the boo and all that yeah. to the replay you know yeah. to the response yeah. yeah it's definitely interesting because we are only allowed to show our looks aren't what people see at home because we have our own camera crew so we can only get our looks in before the refs say the play is under review. So once it's under oh. review, we can only show the ACC network looks or ESPN or whoever's doing it. So, cause we can't have the fans in house seeing something at a slightly different angle that the referees aren't seeing and the people at home aren't seeing. So it's interesting, yeah. What a strange, interesting Look rule. At that that's, a fun perspective. that's a fun fact of the day yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. I that's love cool. it. Thanks Brian. And okay. yeah, as we mentioned, the 20th is a big day. SU lacrosse. Let's get into. It. Actually, no. Before that, I think we got. I think we got to do a little hoops, and then we end it on lacrosse. Judamitz, is he staying? Is he going? That was the big story last week, and this was all around the same time. Now, let's talk about first something that we do know to be true for a fact, and that is Eddie Lampkins is coming in. Syracuse has a new center, comes in from Colorado, and uh, he had a good year with the Buffs. 10.7 rebounds a game, and I'm excited. I'm just – they need bodies down low, and he's someone that looks like he can bang with the best of them. Not only bodies, but he's 6'10". Syracuse big needed boy. a big guy. Maybe big even 6'11". He might even be 6'11". Is 6 he 6'11"? Something. He's, he's very big. Yeah, yeah, they needed a big guy at center, and I'm glad that he got – or that they got – him um i think he'll be a good addition i think that you know that's kind of a statement from adrian autry to just go out and get him uh you know very close to the end of the season so i'm, I'm excited to see what he does at center yeah because also the idea of just like the big boys and the bodies i have to say like my one thing about naheem mcleod is for someone who is as as tall and has as large of a stature as he does sometimes i feel like he didn't take take up enough juice like he didn't take up enough space or he wasn't aggressive enough so i'm interested to see i notice um there was someone on Twitter who was doing a comparison of both of them. And I realized that Lampkin and McLeod are actually the exact same weight. That's mm. what it said, even mm. though even, and they have just totally different body si body types. But Lampkin to me seems like someone who is going to take up a little more space down there, be a little bit more aggressive as far as the way he's able to box out. So that's something I'm really interested to see. Yeah, I hope. I think he'll be more of a nice mix because I know Malik was not a traditional center, but he was very athletic. You know, he right. was always getting those steals, and that was something that was nice at that position, even though it wasn't so traditional. So I think Lampkin will be a nice cross between McLeod and, and uh, Malik. And, and since we last spoke, the McDonald's All-American game happened, so it was really nice to just see Syracuse representation in there. Donnie Freeman, uh, power forward, probably someone that's going to come in and get some serious minutes. I'll say that 
at the least. And uh, only played 13 minutes. There's a lot of guys on those teams. But in those 13 minutes, had three shots, and his two makes were threes. And then one was a buzzer beater. So he's someone that is 6'9", and truly does look to shoot a lot. And that's something I think that's just cool. It's unique. And there's a reason why he's top 25 in the country. And it's because he's, he's a versatile player. Yeah, I was seeing quotes from the athletic writers that were there on Twitter that were at the All-American they love the game. They so with impressed him too. with him. Yeah, no, no. It's Listen, it's amazing you talk about the fact that he's a shooter. That's definitely also something that I feel like when you look at Syracuse basketball, that's something we need. I feel like we need people who are willing to take those risks, willing to keep shooting despite the fact even if it's not going in or if they're having an off game. I think we need people who feel confident enough in themselves to continue to take those risks. Right. And as for Judah Mintz, we know some people that have been transferring out, some that have been coming in. Judah's that what's the deal right now? And it started because of a uh, report with Mike Waters from Syracuse.com. We know Mike well. Mike's a great guy. And he reported that there's multiple sources saying that Judah Mintz would be leaving and entering his name in the draft. Judah did not take too kindly to that report. He didn't say it wasn't true. He didn't say it was false. He just wasn't happy with it. And I think what we're seeing right now is just in 2024, everyone has access to social media, right? And these players and whoever, if they want, can announce it themselves on their own platforms. And whether that was what made him upset or whether he hasn't made up his mind yet, we're going to be finding out. But ultimately, right now, we're holding off on reporting anything on the stations until really we're, we're hearing it from him. I have a, a question I'd actually like to pose to the group on that note, truly from a journalistic standpoint, because this is something that I see coming up a lot from the fans or from whoever who and people have a lot of different opinions on this let's just say that you really nail it like it really is the right call you know in this instance let's just say that Judah Mintz truthfully is leaving do you think it's the right call as a journalist once you find out that information like is it your journalistic obligation to report it or do you see the side where people do get upset when the players aren't able to have that agency to actually be able to tell people about the decision they made on their own not to be weird about, but I see both sides. Yeah. I, I, I really think I'm just kind of split. I don't think there's a right or wrong to it, but ultimately I, someone that's 18, 19, 20 mm -hmm. years old, they get a moment to be able to say it themselves, especially if you, you know, if it, say you find out that, okay, they're going to be announcing it on Friday or it's like, okay, I think I'm going to learn the information, but they want that opportunity to do it themselves. I'll be ready to kind of put something up right afterwards. That's where I stand. At the same time, though, like it is, that's Mike Waters' job is to break that news if he knows it. It's not his job to sit on it in his back pocket. So I saw some really like nasty social media stuff coming at, at him. And he's been, he's a Hall of Fame journalist. He's a great guy, as we know. So like you said, I do see both sides of it. I see why players, you know, want to announce it themselves. But that really was only ever invented because of social media. Before social media, that wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. It was reporters and news outlets. So I see both sides of it, but I, I definitely don't think there's any need for the nastiness. Even like Judah coming in there with like a clown emoji, like let's just let's be nice. <laughs> yeah, no, listen, I, I do I you're absolutely right that this is only something that has started in the um, you know, since the social media era. And I guess, yeah, for me, truthfully, I I guess where I stand on it is I wish that the players were able to just have that moment for themselves because you do see sometimes, and I'm not saying that's what happened in this instance, but I'm saying sometimes you do see journalists get it wrong or jump the gun, which is why I think you see sometimes this pushback and people who are saying they don't always get it right 100% of the time. That being said, there's just no way around it. I wish it was different, but it's not going to happen in the current climate. If you have social media and it's, you, it's your journalistic I guess it's kind of like an ethics thing to really tell people what you know and to give them the information that they need. Then I think as a journalist, you have to do it. But I think if you're going to do it, you have to be 100% sure and right. Which Mike Waters responded to Judah's kind. He said, like, my source is a Judah never said he wasn't leaving. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. so I we'll think that, and I'm happy that you pointed that out because I think that's an important part of it, too, you know. And it's a new age ethical question too, right? Because 100%. 20 years ago, pre-social media platforms and everything, if, if a player wanted to get the word out there, they'd be reaching out to the paper, they'd be reaching out to the local reporters, and that's how it's shared. But it's not a one-way street anymore. People can choose how they want to do it. And, and, but at the same time, there's still people that when they learn that information are going to want to share it. So uh, men's lacrosse, women's lacrosse. The women ranked second in the inside lacrosse poll this week. The men Woo. ranked seventh. And the men are right there, neck and neck at seven. Cornell is at eight. And I think that's a little bit poetic considering that they just went to double overtime 
and Syracuse lost. What do you guys think about that game? What do you guys think about this team now that they have three of their four games? Losses are overtime losses. The others to Notre Dame. I mean, first of all, let's reverse back to like three or four weeks when we were doing our live version of the Orange Zone podcast and Ashley said that Syracuse is a lacrosse school. Not wrong. <laughs> um, okay. But honestly, I mean, first of all, I was I was shocked. I was floored that they lost that game. I mean, you were there. Okay. Every <laughs> no, continue. No, I was just gonna say. I think I think the the whole it was it was like sort of just a classic like Central New York upstate battle where like Pat March is getting ejected. Yeah. What's going on with that? Um, listen, I, I think that was a game where Syracuse really needed to win that. And as we've all discussed, the men's the men's side is so different and so unique. You know, they're in the ACC which is a five-team league, and they're having the ACC tournament, which four teams will be a part of. Outside of that, you only have a 16-team field, which to me, it should be bigger, but end of the day, that's the rules. I do believe it is 16 teams, we said, correct? 16. Potentially one or two playing games. I think it might games. be 17 or 18. Okay, yeah. either, either way, it's not a big field. And I think because of that, you know, every single game counts and matters that much more. Um, do I think they're going to get a shot this year? I really do. If I had to bet money on it, I would. Yeah, that Cornell game, uh, first of all, I was rooting for it to end, no matter what, wait, because... Wait, your hair when we came my back? My hair, it was 30 <laughs> degrees and freezing rain in Ithaca, New York, all right? I needed to go home. The hair told the story. But um, double overtime, a great lacrosse game, like mm. you said, just a classic Northeast lacrosse game. Um, Pat March, like you said, the offensive coordinator for Syracuse, gets ejected, and that's something that Gary Gates said post game was a big factor, because you saw them take two separate six-goal leads in that game, and then they lose the game in double overtime. So clearly it, something was off with the offense in the second half, and that was probably because of his ejection. But it's worth noting now he's serving a one-game suspension for UNC this week. He will not be on the sidelines either, so we'll see if that affects them. And honestly, not that any game is like a, a good game to miss, but like bad game to miss. Yeah. You know, there's only two regular season games left for the men's side. It's UNC and then Virginia, which is a huge, huge, tall task. I mean, if every game counts, that's the kind of game where you you just you you want your offensive guy there. Um, but I do think that UNC for sure more of a winnable game than Virginia. So I think this is where you really you really you have to win this game. And I'd be interested to hear your opinion, Sam. Like Gary Gates in his fourth season now, they haven't been to the tournament since 2021. Like I know some fans are starting to get antsy with the Gary Gate era. Like what? I know, four years is not that long. Third, third season. Third though. season. Yeah, third season. What do you think? I mean, ultimately, listen, with, with Gary Gate, it's just an it's always been an interesting situation because even on even on the women's side, think about how antsy people were with how long he was there and still the Syracuse women have never won a national championship, which I still think is so is it's like it's just crazy to me. I yeah. feel like they have already won one. On the men's side, listen, I still think three years. I think that you you need to have patience. Do I think that they are going to win a national championship this year? I do not. Do I think there has been significant improvement from this year to last year? I do. And that's what I think as a fan you're looking for. Now, you can put a little asterisk in there because of the fact that Syracuse lacrosse has always been big time. The standard for Syracuse lacrosse on the men's side and the women's side, but on the men's side has for a very long time been we want you in the tournament. You should be making some kind of a deep run. Um, this this is this is a team that has an amazing track record. That being said, I don't feel like when Gary Gate took it over, it was at the absolute height or the pinnacle of what Syracuse lacrosse was. So I think he did the best with what he inherited. I think last year was absolutely a letdown, and I would go as far as to call it a disappointment. And I think this year was a major, major rebound and exceeded my expectations based on where they ended off last year. I'm not... I'm I'm okay with the spot that they're in. I don't feel disappointed by by the the three seasons that he's collectively had. And he's gone from four and ten to eight and seven to now nine and four. I mean, damn. And you look again. You look a little bit past that record of nine and four, and you say, okay, they have four losses. Why are they in the top ten? It's because they've only ever lost in overtime, and their only win not in overtime was by two goals to Notre Dame who's ranked number one. Mm. And that tells you everything you need to know. They are in every single game that they're a part of. At Cornell game, they were out to a 7 nothing start. 
you can't say that Pat March and his ejection didn't impact it. Gary talked about it after. It's a hard person to replace, especially when things are moving at the pace that they're moving. And credit to Cornell, too. They're a great program, and they showed it and proved it right there. And it, cre- and it shows a, a bigger story, especially now that we had Colgate just upset Army, the same Army team that beat Syracuse in overtime, Sam's alma mater. <laughs> I was they're in 17. <laughs> They're yeah. very much yeah. in the hunt to be the Patriot League title holder this year. And for such a small field of 18 teams, for three of them to possibly be from Central New York this year, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, we are lacrosse rich up here in Central New York. I Powers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really it really would. It would it would be amazing. And yeah, obviously, you know, quick shout out to Colgate. I, I think that's what's so exciting about um, you know, the the men's field in general for college lacrosse is so many of these teams, you know, even the teams that are unranked versus you run up against a, a top five team, it does a lot of the times feel like it's anyone's game. And that's, I think, what makes sports fun and exciting, you know? Definitely. Big time. And as for the women's side, they can't lose right now. No. They can't lose. They start off the season one and two, I believe. I think they've won seven in a row at now. Seven just, in a row. Seven and yeah. on the ACC. Seven like, and on the ACC. I mean, that's that's disturbing. Like, I, I honestly can't even believe that. And it's funny. I do feel like every year I get to this point with with this team. But for a while, like in the beginning of the season, you know, a couple overtime losses and whatnot, I was like, you know, this team is this team is going to be good. But where it's going to be a, the kind of thing where they end up, you know, there maybe for championship weekend and they just can't pull it out. And like, n- I just don't know. I just don't know. Like th- now they have me thinking. I'm like. Could this be the year? Like yeah. you are just when they thought just when I thought I was out. They reel they pull, me back they in. They pull me back in. <laughs> they pull me back in. That's they, you. They, they have. I mean, still in the back of my mind when I think about anything that worries me. And she has been playing better, but I'm still not a hundred percent sold on Delaney Schweitzer's performance and goal. And I'm wanting to to see her continue to eclipse that fifty percent mark or be pretty close to it. Um, but I mean, I mean offensively, I I don't even know what you do against this team. I know I said it last week, but I feel like versatility is the way that you define the Syracuse offense. It's it's insane. It's just like I feel like every single time you look at the box score, there's eight, nine, ten people who are scoring in a game. Like that's not normal. It's yeah. almost like they're deciding ahead of time, like, okay, let's give this goal to so and so. Right? It's Who's gonna amazing. have a good day today? Like, who let's wants play to score our whole four today? Raise your hand. Yeah. That's how it's <laughs> been. And so they have two games left. They are at Clemson this weekend. So both teams are away. Syracuse is at UNC. UNC being the bottom of the ACC standings. And that's the AC standings of five teams. The ACC tournament is back this year. Uh, and that's four teams. So one team doesn't make it. So if Syracuse wins one of their final two games, they are in. And this is really the, the weekend to do it. Because Virginia, there's no telling what's going to happen in that game. Because, yeah, the... The Hoos are good, as they always are under Lars, Lars Tiffany. Mm-hmm. But that's the final game of the season. They're ranked second. I think just take care of business against the Tar Heels and help further, hopefully, cement your spot where if there's an at-large bid available, that they can grab one this year. 100%. You could say the same thing on the women's side. I feel like the Clemson game, to me, feels like a lock. But then they end the season against Boston College, which they've done for the past few years in a row. And I feel like that game is it gives you that feel of one of those instant classics. The rivalry continues to build because they see each other in the playoffs so frequently. That's the kind of game where you just don't know what's going to happen. And you want to go into it with another win against Clemson, feeling like the absolute powerhouse that that team has been so far into the season. Yeah, and the men's team, like we mentioned, won't have Pat March at UNC, but they do have a lot of rest. They didn't play this last weekend. The last yeah, time they break. played was that Cornell game two Tuesdays ago. So they're coming off like 10 days of rest, recuperate after that uh, overtime loss, and and hopefully get back into the swing of things. All right, let's go for double W's on Saturday. Double W's. Double W's. Put them up. There we go. This That's is our show. <laughs> oh, should we, should we all do it? Yeah. W? You can go camera to camera. Awesome. I'll go Skycam too. W's all around. That's our show. Samantha Crossan, Ashley Winskowski, Brian Anelli on the producer. Mike, I'm Tommy Sladek. Final thoughts? Um, final thoughts. I guess I would just say that I would like to see I, – I would feel extremely happy for these Syracuse teams if for the Syracuse women they went out the last two games and for the Syracuse men – they they pull one out of two. I feel happy with two out of two. I, I think fans will feel ecstatic. I think that will exceed expectations.
Yeah, I would love to see the Syracuse men in the NCAA tournament this year. Like you said, the women pretty much a lock. But I think for the men to get there, that would be a huge accomplishment for Gary Gate and just for his team. Like you said, that's made such marked improvements over over the last three years. So hopefully, hopefully we're celebrating some lacrosse. Keep making strides. That's our show. Thank you for watching. Make sure you're liking, subscribing, commenting as we chase the big 1,000. Peace. We're out of here.